again. Um, thanks for being fairly prompt going back here. Um, this one, this panel session is how to make the crisis work for liberty. From right to left, we've got Tim Cox, who blogs for Liberal Vision. Uh, Steve Davis, who you already know from the uh, Education Director of the Institute of American Public Affairs. Uh, we have Josie Appleton, who is convener of the Manifesto Club. And finally, Tom Cloverty, uh, who is executive director of the Adam Smith Institute. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today regarding the financial crisis that we've just experienced is the fact that there's quite a significant opportunity um, to be taken here. And the, the current situation puts governments in a very, very difficult position. I'm not just talking about the UK government, but governments across Europe um, and indeed the world. There, there's a need to repay debts to cover some of the deficit to, uh, to repay a lot of the money that's been borrowed previously. Um, however, people, politicians have caught between the quandrum of, of appeasing a, an electorate and also managing to maintain growth. Now, as I'm sure most people in here will agree, that one of the, the best drivers of growth is through trade, is through allowing people to produce and sell and move goods and, and um, services around. The difficulty here, of course, is that so many of the measures that governments implement and have implemented over the last 13 years um, have resulted in, in stifling this capacity. Um, and what I see is that there is an opportunity here regarding the alignment of business needs in the UK and the alignment of individuals for wanting greater liberty and, and greater freedoms to be able to behave and act as they do and to be able to account for their own money. Uh, I, I think that what we can see is that potentially is that the government, by, by rolling back its role in society and its role in micromanaging the economy, could create a great deal of freedom for business to, to expand and to enjoy the opportunities that the UK brings to it. But also, that with that, will come a lot of other freedoms. And let me talk about that for a bit. The key objective of the post-crisis era should be to ensure that Britain remains an attractive place to trade and to do business. I mean, if you read the mirror too much or whatever, you'll probably have the impression that banks are terrible and these big law firms that are paying huge bonuses and so forth are all legal. Well, in fact, that's not true. Um, we need businesses. Businesses provide our everyday goods. They, they allow us to, to live a very, very good standard of living. With businesses comes all of the benefits that we commonly associate, not just the employment, obviously, but uh, cheaper goods through specialisation for the economies of scale. The business community will be driven by the needs of the people. Um, that, that is how it operates. The two are inextricably linked. And what I mean by this is if businesses don't respond to what people want, they generally don't do terribly well and they'll fail. And therefore, we shouldn't be seeing business as something that's outside of the realms of freedom and our liberty in terms of our role in society, but actually something that's integral to it. The I would argue that, that so far, the coalition government, and I'm not looking to vote some sympathy here, but the coalition government has, has sort of has flirted with this without actually enacting any real significant change we've seen a mismatch of policies and ideas on this basis. So that with, the, with the objective, the idea to, re, to stimulate the economy is to make Britain <coughs> the best place for businesses across the world to operate. We've seen anti-business taxes come in. Um, I don't know if any of you picked up on the North Sea oil supplementary taxes, which was just an overnight switch from Osborne, increasing from 20 to 32%. The immediate reaction from the business community, um, we, we saw them pull, pull back. We saw project, projects put on hold in the North Sea. We saw businesses council projects that they had lined up, Centrica, Valiant, Total, Statoil, etc. They all just said, actually, no, this is no longer a problem. This is no longer a good place for us to operate. With that comes jobs. We've also seen no real simplification of the tax code. I mean, there's all sorts of anecdotes floating around about the size of the tax code, you know, how many war Tolstoy's War and Peace novels it amounts to. But, I mean, it's absolutely absurd. It's 11,520 pages, I think, at the last count. I don't know if Osborne promised to cut 100 pages. Fantastic. I mean, it really is a drop in the ocean. I mean, this thing is enormous. And what the effect that this has is, is not just dealing with big, big businesses. The big businesses can afford to pay accountants and lawyers and so forth to address these issues and to get around them. But what this affects is it affects the smaller businesses, the people, the entrepreneurs in society, the people that are trying to sort of make their way, the aspirational classes. And it has a very, very negative effect on them. So what I would argue is that the priority for the coalition government now should be looking at this be breaking down these barriers to entry for, for wannabe businessmen. They should be breaking down the barriers of entry for existing businesses, allowing them to expand and grow. And with that has to go swathes of stifling regulation. Every week a pub closed in the UK. 
what's one of the driving factors behind that? We've got the smoking ban, we've got the increase in, in the, the duty on alcohol products that are sold, so forth and so forth. In almost every aspect of government intervention in life, you can see that it has negative effects on the business, on, upon the business community. And that is something that we can no longer afford. We can no longer turn around and say, okay, yeah, but these guys are making lots of money, they can afford to lose a few pence here and there. They can't. You know, their profit margins are tight, and they will move abroad. And, and moving abroad, we're not just losing the headquarters, we're also losing access to a lot of the goods and services we previously enjoyed. So for me, I think we're still at a critical juncture here. I think there is a tremendous opportunity out of the financial crisis. I think that the government, the coalition government can come forward and say, well, yes, actually, Britain is open for business. We are going to roll back a lot of the, sort of the, the oppressive regulation and so forth. And that will have the dual effect of enhancing our freedom on a day-to-day -day basis, but also allowing the entrepreneurs and small businesses and so forth to progress and succeed in society and offer us the goods and services that we need at affordable prices. And I think that we do need to be very, very wary about any actions to the contrary of that. I mean, just this week we heard Barclays, again, I'm sure, for, for a lot of the UK, let, um, a lot of the UK voting public, Barclays aren't a particularly popular brand at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, they're, they're threatening to move to New York. They've said that the current tax regime is too stifling for them and so forth. The, these are all issues, and, and with that goes, a huge, goes our capacity to be a major player in the commercial field. And I think that, that is something we should take very, very seriously. <coughs> so in, in summary, I'd say that the government needs to roll back its role within society, not just on social issues, which are hugely important, but with them, all of the economic <coughs> issues that come along with it. And if it doesn't, it's going to really struggle to re-stimulate the economy and encourage the growth that we all need. Thank you. Well, um, Ronald Emanuel, uh, Barack Obama's former chief of staff, who just recently left mayor of Chicago, famously said uh, soon after they took office that you should never allow a crisis to go to waste. Uh, and that was a profoundly insightful remark, I think, in terms of politics, because uh, it's true, crises prevent, or present us, if you like, with enormous opportunities for changes of course and profound change, and opening up arguments in a way that you can't do during regular uh, politics as usual. When you are in a non-crisis situation, if you will, when things are just going on pretty much as they have done for quite a while, a whole range of issues, a whole range of arguments are simply not on the agenda. They're just not taken seriously. Uh, all kinds of things, if you like, are taken for granted. Uh, all kinds of established interests have an effective veto on discussion of a whole range of alternatives to the way things are. Now, by contrast, when a crisis occurs, suddenly all kinds of things are up for grabs. When you have a crisis, like the financial crisis of two years ago, uh, or something I would, I would argue at a moment even more profound, the kind of culminating crisis of the modern state, which I think is what we're living through, uh, then suddenly you can say all kinds of things and have them taken seriously. One example of this, directly from the financial crisis, is the way in which radical thinking about monetary policy has now become quite respectable and interesting to a lot of people. Uh, three or four years ago, if you were one of these people who thought that you should get rid of fractional reserve banking, uh, or you were opposed to the existence of central banks, uh, you were regarded as being way out in coup land, basically. Uh, that kind of argument is now taken seriously by all sorts of people. Uh, I was recently at a student conference in Warwick University, and I met Paul Mason, the uh, economics editor of Newsnight, uh, and he told me, when uh, we were going to cab back to Coventry Station, uh, that he thought the Austrians had the only really coherent account of why the crisis had happened, uh, and the only coherent set of policy prescriptions, which rather surprised me given his own views, but the point is, people like him, him and Paul Meekfield are now taking these ideas seriously. So the crisis in that sense does present an enormous opportunity now, when I talk about the crisis, I don't just mean the financial crisis of 2008. I think there's something deeper and more profound than that. I think we're actually in the early stages of a profound realignment of politics in this country, for one thing. Uh, I think it will take about a decade, but I think it's already begun. And this is not without precedent. I think, actually, if you look at the history of British politics, right back to the 1670s and the first parties appearing and the exclusion crisis, that about every 40 or 50 years or so, there's been a major reshuffling or realignment of the political forces and also a redefinition of what politics is about. And I think we're in the early stages of such a realignment there. Now, what I think we also have, uh, as, which constitutes part of the crisis that we're living through, is a crisis of the modern state, at least in Britain. Uh, one of the basic facts about this country is that uh, no British government in peacetime has ever been able to raise more than 38% of national income 
in revenue.